All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music's new free monthly web series called Conversations with our Curator. I'm Melissa Ziobro, our curator, and tonight I will be in conversation with, I mean, really we'll all be in conversation with authors Laura Flam and Emily Sue Lemowitz. They have recently released this fabulous book, But Will You Love Me Tomorrow? An Oral History of the 60s Girl Groups, which is based on over 100 interviews with members of the Angels, the Babettes, the Chiffons, the Crystals, the Dixie Cups, the Ronettes, the Shirelles, the Supremes, and more, including the Blossoms, which included the gorgeous, talented, and tenacious 2023 Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music American Music Honors Awardee, Darlene Love. So I just, I can't wait to dive in and talk about this book. But first, just a few housekeeping details. If you are not super familiar with the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music at Monmouth University here at the Jersey Shore, we preserve the legacy of Bruce Springsteen. We are his official repository. But we also celebrate the history of American music and its diversity of artists and genres more broadly with our archival collection, our exhibits, and our programming, hence this evening. Um, we at the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music are a tiny team. There's me, our executive director, Bob Santelli, director Eileen Chapman, Programs Manager Jerry Houseworth and our amazing administrative assistant, Annalon LeMay. We are currently in the midst of planning for a 30,000 square foot new facility, which is scheduled to open in the spring of 2026. So you can see more about our work at springsteenarchives.org or find us on virtually any social media channel. We've got the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, all that good stuff. So please follow us and, and get involved more. We'd love to see you again. So thank you for letting me introduce us just a little bit to you. Um, with that, let's get back to tonight's program. So conversations with our curator, right? We are featuring in this free virtual series, different researchers and writers who are exploring new perspectives in American music history. After an initial conversation with me, we will then open it up to Q&A with the audience, which I always like to say is really the best part. We try to keep these programs overall to no more than one hour. So tonight, as I noted, we're joined by Laura and Emily. So ladies, I'd love to start with you both just introducing yourselves a little bit. Laura, would you care to go first? Sure. I'm Laura Flam. Uh, Emily and I are old friends and big fans of music and especially girl groups music. We've been going to the shows for years and that's where we became more interested in finding out about the women who voiced the music. Awesome. And Emily? <laughs> oh, excuse me. I'm Emily and uh, I'm a writer. We both live in Brooklyn, New York, but I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay Area. And I am uh, started in poetry and transitioned to nonfiction. And, um, you know, working with oral histories has been a really huge joy and a really uh, interesting way to enter the kind of nonfiction world as someone who does kind of focus more on a kind of poetic uh, perspective. So um, that's kind of what both of us oh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And then, you know, way to knock it out of the park with this venture, this book, but will you love me tomorrow in oral history of the 60s girl groups? Um, you know, just had me enthralled from, from the moment I opened it. Give us, because inevitably some folks in the audience have read the book already. Some have not. If they've not, you know, they're going to go order it the second we get off the Zoom. So <laughs> give, us, <laughs> give us like your elevator pitch, your thumbnail overview of the book. 
Sure. Um, I would say our elevator pitch is that the songs of the girl groups of the 50s and 60s, groups that you mentioned, you know, the Ronettes, the Shirelles, the Chantelles, the Chiffons, you know, this is music that is in everybody's life. It's all over, everywhere, all of the time, and part of our DNA practically. But in terms of the actual artists who who voice the music, there really is not very much information out, out there about them. And when there is, it's sort of in the shadows of their, usually their producers or record label owners, people like Phil Spector or Barry Gordy. So we really went on, on our mission statement was to sort of give a voice to these women that we hear and um, and find out about their lives, their, contrib their contributions to their own music and who they are as people and what they went through in the music industry and beyond in their lives. Hmm. You know, I love that. Most people could probably sing. If I if I called on one of our audience members at random, they could probably sing, Will You Love Me Tomorrow? Right now, right? On command. <laughs> but they might not Absolutely. be able to name the girl group famous for singing it. You know, the same goes for so many of the songs in this genre. In your introduction, you write that the groups in their heyday were, quote, treated as interchangeable and faceless, beautiful girls to be switched around and replaced at the whims of managers, record producers, and songwriters. Why do you think that was? I mean, I think, you know, we've, we, I think there's a lot of different reasons when we tried to write the introduction. We thought a lot about, is there one uh, one kind of abuse of power? Is there one way someone did this? But realistically, they were all individual situations. And, you know, it's cl also classic, right? These are very young people from marginalized communities. And even if you weren't from a more marginalized community, a young person or anybody outside the entertainment industry would have no idea how to handle it. I mean, you have generations of entertainers who still struggle dealing with the ins and outs of the entertainment industry. So I think, you know, there's a lot of exploitation of uh, people who they assume are not going to know as much or have as much power to fight it, even if they do know. Um, and then, you know, like any artist can speak to this, I think, across any genre, which is that like, if you love something like people who see it as a moneymaker will and can take advantage of the artist. And that's true to this day, you know? Um, but I do think a prevailing innocence of the culture let it occur in a kind of uh, abundance that um, I hope, or, you know, might move around in society in a different way. But I do think in general, the average citizen would, um, we have stories now of child stars. We have stories now of, horrible things happening, you know, but then media didn't even come that way. So I think a lot of it was also just excitement over being able to sing in public. Yeah, and these were the, these were the, this was the beginning of pop music and rock and roll. So these were really the first people to go through these experiences. Judy Craig from the Chiffon said that they went through what they went through so that artists coming behind them could have it a little bit better. And so now artists have those tales that they've heard and they, you know, they're sort of cautionary tales of, of, you know, the, of the biz. But at the time, these were the first people to go through those experiences. So they were even more sort of innocent and naive to the situation. Mm. You mentioned the age of some of these women, girls, really, right? I mean, some of them were 12, 13, 14, 15 they needed chaperones. Um, they talk about the Board of Ed requiring them to do distance learning and send their schoolwork in via mail while they're out on the road. Um, there's a great story in here about the crystals going into the recording studio right from prom, like not even getting changed. Uh, why do you think it was these very, very young girls involved in these groups? Were they being selected at that age because they were vulnerable or what's going on there? Why were so many of these girls so young? It was, you know, this was music made by young people for young people. And it was really the first, you know, rock and roll was really the first music that was written and recorded by young people for young people and for a young audience writing about things that, you know, teenagers related to. So I think that by nature, 
you know, it was, it was teenagers performing for a teenage crowd about teenage issues and teenage um, things that come up in teenage life. But I at least personally think that, you know, it also, um, the fact that they were so young was kind of a, an extra bonus in some ways for producers, record labels that, you know, it was the wild west back then at the music industry, even more than now. So I think it worked out to their advantage even more that these were really young, young people coming from, you know, families that didn't have, an, you know, any experience in the entertainment industry and things like that. But also, just by nature, it was, you know, the first young people singing about young issues to other young people. So they had to be young because, you know, if you're not young, then you're old to young people. <laughs> so I also think it's about how they were finding people. You know, it's a phenomenon where people were out on the street and, you know, that was in person, obviously, was like a much more a uh, prevalent way of finding um, entertainment back then and also entertaining oneself, right? So a lot of people also knew how to do these things. So bringing them into the public sphere, um, I think it was, I don't think it made it in the interviews, but several people would describe like at least one person in the family would have to be an entertainer or of some kind for the evening. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is something that a family would need to entertain themselves. So I think also it was, the first time like girls or young girls were also being allowed to do some of this stuff in public, even pseudo public private spaces like churches and talent shows, which is like the majority of women get discovered or girls are discovered via talent shows at the schools. So I think in some ways you're also seeing an empowerment of young girls, putting them in this position and that like they are now in front of the eyes of uh, entertainment uh, industry people like one woman, a manager who was well beyond her or, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, for Zell. She was ahead of her time and uh, she would just drive around the neighborhood and look for people that way, you know, or kids would go to shows and sing out in public and find each other that way. So I think they're also just benefiting from like a youthful exuberance of wanting to be out in the world. Yeah, and you have this really interesting discussion of how the introduction of like the transistor radio was creating a market for music by teens for teens because kids could listen to the transistor radio and get away from their parents like Bing Crosby records or something on the Victrola in the living room. And that was a really interesting, <laughs> I think, you know, way that you tied this into the technological innovations of the period too. Let's go there back. There's a lot of things coming together. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just to finish up, as there were a lot of things coming together at that time. You know, it was it was post war. It was a time of a lot of excitement in the country and the birth of the teenager. Teenagers getting an allowance for the first time and having, you know, Jeff Barry, the songwriter, said literally having a buck to go out and buy a record. And at the same time, having this technology with the transistor radio, picking up on radio stations, being exposed to music that is beyond what they would hear you know, at their parents' house or even necessarily in their neighborhoods and then being able to go out and buy the record and a whole industry and then people seeing that there's money to be made in the industry and a whole industry being created around that. Yeah, I always say that, you know, studying music history is a, just a portal to study these broader trends in American life and you illustrated that really well. Talk to us thank, about thank the you. significance of the title a little bit, right? But Will You Love Me Tomorrow? It's a famous first, right? And I don't know if everyone in the audience would know that. Tell us about the famous first. Um, well, it's the first song uh, of the girl group sound that is a number one. It's the first song, uh, I believe, I don't want to get this wrong, but by a Black girl group to hit number one. And it's Carol King's first number one, if I'm not mistaken. That's, who wrote that's it? With who her. wrote it? All in my notes. Gotten. I just read it. It's fresh in my mind. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad I got all those. That was like a, a little test. But, um, you know, it's such an important song. And we chose that song for the title because not only was it the first in all these groundbreaking ways at the time, but we really do think it emulates or speaks to how the women have kind of been erased from music history but the music hasn't. And that is a is a kind of sleight of hand that um, 
we still haven't fully figured out. And again, a lot of things come together for something like that to happen. But, um, you know, that song really became a kind of anthem for young women at the time. Um, and so we wanted to honor that, but also honor the Shirelles who sing the song, because I think it's something like they have nine top 40 hits in a three year span. They're really, you know, we can look for a lot of reasons. A lot of groups were forgotten in at least how we write about pop music history, but the Shirelles seem to be one of the biggest uh, erasures in that they were the first of so many and they really became an exact blueprint for the girl groups that just happened months later, but also up until now and um, up until something like Destiny's Child, they were the blueprint for the Supremes, you know, so we really wanted to make sure we honored both the hugeness of the song, but the hugeness of the group and kind of the injustice of them the all four of them being erased from music history in that way. That song is also totally groundbreaking in terms of its subject matter. And it came out the same year the FDA approved the birth control pill. And at least to my knowledge is the first song from a female point of view, even though it was the lyrics were written by Jerry Goff and Carol King's husband, which is funny, but it's really the first song with from a female point of view voicing um, concerns about sex um, about respect and worth and value it, having to do with those things. And so at the time, you know, it was banned by the Catholic church. It, you know, it was a very groundbreaking song at the time. So it was also a first in terms of female empowerment and the girl groups in general, you know, they wore these beautiful crinoline dresses and aren't necessarily people that would necessarily pop into your mind when you have conversations about the first feminists, but they were really, ahead of their time, you know, they, they changed, they, they inspired so many young girls to go out and express themselves and their own voices and, and a song like, um, you know, will you love me tomorrow, the subject matter, they really moved the needle in terms of um, you know, what they called the women's liberation movement at the time. I'm glad that you referenced birth control there, because you do insert one of very few authors notes to give readers that context. And, you know, just as I mentioned with the transistor radio, I think that's one of the huge strengths of the book is it's just, it's wonderful storytelling. And yet you ground it in these broader themes in American history and life, which is, you know, really commendable. Thank you. Thank you. You also, you quote a writer, it's just a good song, right? You quote a writer who says they once played the song for eight hours straight and it only gets better and better. And I had to laugh when I read that because I've been doing that in the lead up to this chat and I couldn't agree more. It's just a good song, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We never get tired of the music, like neither of us. And I think it really speaks to the fact that on every level, these are just also amazing pop songs. And I know this is a little off topic, I'm sorry, but it just spurred this thought, you know, um, we were talking about Judy Craig of the Chiffon. She also said something like, we were the first pop artists. And when we think about like the genres of American music, it's so com more complicated, so much more complicated than like the average consumer of music knows, just like you're saying, because of these historical contexts that we're not aware of when we're engaging with music, right? Um, and so I think, you know, it's not something we belabor hugely, but it is something we fully believe, which is that the way we view pop music as a genre now, these uh, these women were really the foundation of that. And I just think that that kind of uh, sticks with how important their, their sound is just to us in the ether of our culture, you know? So. Yeah, very well said. I know that's cool. No, no, that's wonderful. So I was floored by the fact that you conducted over a hundred interviews. That's with, you know, women and men, singers, songwriters, producers, DJs. Talk to us about the enormous process of locating all of these narrators. How did you find people to interview? Well, a lot of people we found through meeting other people. You know, you meet the first couple of people and we tried not to get off the phone with anybody without... And because most of these interviews were recorded on the phone, this was during COVID, which was also uh, helpful to this process because these are, for the most part, artists who are still touring and at least were a lot of them retired over COVID. But so people were home 
and it's usually people who are out on the road and busy all the time, but everybody was home in a sort of self-reflective period. But we tried to not get off the phone without getting some lead to somebody else. But also we use the phone book. You know, we read so many books and watched so many movies of just trying to figure out who was in the room and then tried to find a way to get in touch with that person that was in the room, whether directly or trying to find somebody else who may have met that person. So it was part of the whole, the excitement of the whole project is sort of private investigative, investigative experience of, you know, looking somebody up in the phone book and knowing that they once lived in Queens and what their maiden name was and, you know, but then who they married and, and all of the ways that you try to, to track people down. And then we just called them on the phone, you know, and in general, um, it's a group of women who f feel that they have been underrepresented for all of all that they've contributed to music and to culture. So um, we were worried that since it was a group of women who'd been exploited a lot, that there would be there would be a lot of trepidation about talking talking to us about their lives and um you know we made it very clear that we are fans and this this is a love this is you know a project that came out of a lot of love but the you know the women felt that they they really wanted to tell their stories they had a huge part we were just talking about them the, you know moving the needle in terms of of women and women's rights but also most of those most of these were black artists and this was during you know the most of the book takes place between 1955 and 1965 which is the height of the civil rights movement too and these were artists that were traveling on tours that toured the south and they were introducing white teenagers to black culture and black music and and doing a lot of work in in the civil rights movement that they're largely uncredited for because in the same way you know you don't look at them and think you know these are soldiers in the civil rights movement but they were you know they were they were going out and putting themselves in danger and and in situations that were at times very stressful and demoralizing in order to spread the music and also to to change people's minds and perspectives and they really did you know so let's um talk about that for a moment you just noted most of these were black artists they were soldiers in the civil rights movement i mean there were some tough stories in here. Um, there's one that comes to mind about an artist and I'm blanking on the name at the moment, but she accidentally hits a white waitress with the menu and then they have to hide her. They're literally afraid she will be lynched over this. Um, there's a quote from Barbara English of the Cliquettes and she says, you're always walking around afraid of racial bias in some of these places. They would show you hostility even though they're loving your music. Beverly Lee of the Shirelle says, to a certain degree, we were guinea pigs for desegregation. You want a door open? Send the Shirelles. Can you talk to us a little more about that? Because I think it's incredibly important and something that people probably don't ever consider as they are just enjoying the music. Sure. I mean, the Shirelles specifically, again, going back to stuff they did because of their huge popularity, they were sent into... Um, you know, if we if we asked uh, them to list the places they probably played the first desegregated concert, it would be I don't know if they would be able to do it because there were so many. I mean, Selma, Birmingham, they would be sent places because essentially like people didn't know they were black often and the records um, didn't picture black people that were sold in the South purposefully to sell the record. So excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> so their so their images didn't appear on their records most of the time you know for example tonight's the night the Shirelles record it's a picture of you know a prom dress and gloves and you know anyway oh ahead. yeah so until they reach the height like a huge height people booking them again because they don't have the internet they don't have you know you have a newspaper and you and if they're on bandstand and you happen to watch that you know so and that is new to national distribution as well so the Shirelles specifically would show up often with open hostilities having to essentially as children make this situation okay or like palatable enough you know so I think that really stuck with us is just how regular that became and also you know they were doing all this work but they didn't choose to do this work this work was put on them 
by society, not even by the people who sent them down there to sing, right? Someone like Dick Clark, who organized, I'd say the majority of the shows that went through the South, was not thinking, oh, they're doing this work. He was thinking, how much money can I make by bringing them to the South? Because our first question as like adults with friends who have children this age, or were, why did you go somewhere where kids would be so unsafe? I mean, these are children, you know? And many of them without a policy, you know, not understanding the social structures, the violence. I mean, obviously they do because they live it, but from they're still children, you know? So um, I also think they don't get necessarily credit for being the first kind of girls, yeah, to go out and be just living life in public. And I think that presented its own kind of violence that a child just couldn't understand. Um, so it was really fascinating to hear these stories. Obviously, we're honored that they spoke to us about them, but also learning it as a history, you know, being our age, and then to hear it as obviously we know now it's not totally a history. It's not over. It's not something we have to stop fighting for as our civil rights, you know. So it was a it was really eye-opening to understand that these were children who were sent and doing the work of soldiers in the civil rights movement, but really were just honestly like 11 and 12 year olds whose parents were like, yeah, if you sing, you might make a dime, I guess, have fun. <laughs> and being told that their children would be safe from someone they saw as like a respectable, uh, white, presentable person. Um, so I think it's something that also left a kind of bitter taste in our mouth seeing children treated this way. And like, it still is something that, yes, the women primarily are proud of it and they did amazing work, but it's still something that um, I feel like we see their childhoods taken away in those moments, but they don't necessarily, they still see it as work, you know, just doing the job. And it's really amazing also how humble that is at the same time. You talk about it as work and you said, oh, you might make a dime. Some of these groups are enormously popular and there was money being made, but it wasn't usually the girls who got it, right? Emma from the Babettes notes, quote, all the songs, the company is making all that money. You're not making any. Can you tell us a little bit about where the money was going? Well, structurally, the way the music business is structured, uh, the people who whoever owns the publishing is the person who who makes the money for the most part so the way that things were set up the music industry back then was that as soon as it became obvious that there was so much money to be made in um in the in the music industry professional songwriters basically wrote 99 percent, i'd say of pop, pop and rock and roll songs up until um, things were sort of disrupted in the mid 60s when groups like the Beatles came along and bands and people started writing their own material more. But in the in the 50s and early 60s, um, a lot of it happened here in New York at a building called the Brill Building that most of the music business on the East Coast was operating out of. And songwriting was a job that you would go into and, you know, basically almost like punch a time card and go in and crank out songs all day and you would work for a publisher and they would work getting your songs to producers and those producers would record them. And as an artist, what you were left with, since you hadn't written the songs and you didn't own the publishing, was the opportunity to perform and make money off of those performances. And that's where things get much squirrelier in terms of um, the shadiness of the business. You know, there's these promoters and managers and it's, it really became sort of a fly by night business and people were showing, you know, people would show up to performances and not get paid, get paid in nickels. Their managers would, you know, one of the chiffons were once paid in change for a, a show that they did. Um, and most of these were, were indie record labels too. And they were, you know, they here one day and gone the next. So a lot, you know, a group like the Chantels who, uh, maybe was their their big hit and it was one of the first big girl group hits it didn't go to number one but it's a huge song and if you look up the Chantels maybe it will come on and you'll immediately know it and be overcome with emotion because it's a beautiful song but they were on a record label that was 
owned by a wonderful creative uh, trailblazer who was also a degenerate gambler. And he was constantly getting money from the mob to, um, to pay off his gambling debts. And he ended up giving them the record label. And so the Chantels who were promised a trust that they were gonna come into when they were 21 years old, you know, when, when it happened, the money was gone. And so they never, they never got paid. You know, they got a small allowance, you know, maybe $20 a week or something, I think, that they split. Uh, you know, these are groups with four, five, three, four, five, six girls in them. So everything that they get, they're also splitting. And these groups, you know, the 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 tours had, you know, everyone notoriously says, you know, you pay 50 cents and you see five bands in a movie. So in terms of how much people were getting paid to do the shows, it really wasn't a lot of money. And, you know, you're splitting it with all of these people if you're even getting the money. So in the end, you know, even though there are the legacy of these songs and all, and these women's voices are all over the place, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, it was all on terrestrial radio, which they weren't, when your voice is played on it, you don't get money for. So really, the only money that you can really make is performance. And that music, it's so special, but it was, you know, like all music, it was here and then it was gone. And those opportunities went away quickly. Mm. And it's worth mentioning, like, at the time, even though songwriters, you'd assume, would get their publishing rights to their songs because they're the ones who authored them, that's actually not what was happening either. So songwriters were also in a kind of uh, structure where they did not have direct access to the artists or the record labels. So um, whoever owned the publishing company often took the publishing rights. Or at least half of them. Or at least half of them. And so... Um, so it, there are so many different steps that different groups kind of different steps at which different groups had different issues. And I think the one that's the most opaque is the manager relationship because they're also very intimate relationships and something like we said, we are fans of the music. So we don't, we don't talk about, um, necessarily relation like we're not going to press upon a relationship that ended on a positive note that perhaps um if you look at paper for example with Motown or anywhere where the managers were also the record label that's probably the areas or the groups that have the most chance or most risk because there's just not essentially two people vying for power over their financials um or two groups so someone like the Shirelles who were managed by Florence Greenberg who also owned their record label um, and all of the Motown groups. That's probably where you see the most financial, um, illegal financial manipulation, right? The rest is like, it's shocking what's legal. I mean, it's like all the money, when you go in to record, like we're saying, this is the money you get if it's a hit, you know? So that's the one in a million chance you're taking. But when you record, I don't know if it's done this way today, but back then the money is still on the recording artist. The same way if you're a writer, you're paying for your life and everything that goes into that until you sell it, like you sell the material. I mean, I think that's probably the same for a painter, right? You know, there aren't, but with an industry, you're also taking on enormous amount of costs because of the recording. So these songs, these women probably, or these girls might start thousands and thousands of dollars in debt, hoping for a hit too. So there is a, but then like the balance is that they're never going to have to pay that back if it's not a hit. So there's a lot of like, I guess you say like people on different sides of that being like, this is the business. And it's yeah. like, well, that doesn't make it okay. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of that that we encountered too. Yeah. Now, I want to go back to your methodology for a moment, if I may. We talked about, you know, 100 interviews. We talked about how you located your narrators. You don't have to name names, but were there some folks that you really wanted to talk to who wouldn't participate for one reason or another? Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. There were some um, group members who just didn't want to, this was so long ago, they didn't want to talk about it. And then there were some people like Diana Ross that we just could not reach. She's just too famous. And, you know, she, we, we tried, we, um, you know, one of, there's so much mythology around Diana Ross and around Motown. And, you know, a lot of it, 
a lot of it is true, but also, you know, I think that we think that there's a lot of sexism that's also involved in the the view of Diana Ross. You know, she was an ambitious woman who was going after what she wanted and she gets a bad rap in a way that if she had been a, a male artist, people probably wouldn't approach her legacy in the same way. So we really wanted to give her the opportunity to talk about that now, you know, in in this, you know, in 2020 or 2021 and and talk about um what she thinks of that legacy but we just couldn't we just couldn't get to her okay okay now outside of your introduction you use very little of your own text and I wasn't expecting that going in you know I was expecting your text kind of interspersed with quotes to prove a point but it's really primarily just excerpts from the oral histories woven together. Um, occasionally there's a one or two line kind of author's note on occasion. So I'm fascinated by how you chose to organize it. Can you talk a little bit uh, about how you landed on that means of organizing the book? Yeah, I think, you know, I always, I always remember early conversations in the project um, and Laura brought up a really good point early on, which is, you know, the whole point is that we have not heard from these women, that even when the press was happening, no one asked about these women. Do you want to know about Phil Spector and the Wrecking Crew? Do you want to know about Barry Gordy and Motown? Like you can find that information, but you might hear that Darlene was on a track, that Phil did something crazy, that whatever, but you don't, you don't, and she's probably one of the the people who've done more interviews and it's like but even then it's like and she's one woman that was in that room like that's the one female perspective we have thank god but like you know so Laura really emphasized that and it became incredibly important to us especially when we noticed frankly like the differences between us and the women right like one of which being that we didn't grow up in this time period <laughs> one of which being we're not black um you know there are we, we're not musicians. I mean, there are so many differences that are going to go into our choices in the first place. Like, how are we going to then also speak on behalf of them when we have them here doing it, for, doing it for themselves? And that created a lot of like logistical work. Um, but I think those are the parts where, and Laura can speak to this more because this is more in my own head. I think those are the parts where for me being a poet helped because my process wasn't argument based or thesis based it's really like what is the material trying to you know it's a little more kind of art leaning where it's like what is this material trying to do itself and how can I facilitate that and Laura was already in that headspace with the oral history so I feel like that really helped us kind of just prioritize that and at every step I think we just made sure to do that um and then, you know, because the stories are somewhat similar, though not the same at all, we just know as a reader, you might get tired of being like, this is how this started. This is how this started. So we chose to find, you know, different points in each career to highlight different groups from there. Also, by nature, history is when you're interviewing over 100 people about something that happened 60 years ago, 80 years ago. There, yeah. <laughs> you know, there are going to be different memories. People were told different things at the time. And we really didn't want to be the gatekeepers of the truth and distill it through our own perspective of, you know, all of these people gave us perspectives. Which one is the, the right perspective? You know, we, we just wanted people to be able to have a, a platform to tell their stories. And we wanted it to be immersive in a, and to for the readers to stay in the story with the with the storytellers who are telling them and to to not to jump in and interrupt and not to not to add our own opinions in and to just let you know sometimes there are conflicting memories of what happened and you know and and that's life you know whether a lot of time has gone by or not and that doesn't mean that one person's one person's opinion or the way that they analyze the situation is any more correct than another we just wanted to make sure that we got them all in there and stay and stay out of the way. I also think it helps to have two people because even for a quote that we would be discussing, like we'd be like, that's not what they meant. And then we would have it out like not maliciously or anything, but 
with our own analysis. And that would really prove to us that that's a, probably a productive quote, right? Because, um, and I think those are also, again, coming from different uh, perspectives, instead of those being problematic, those were probably also our favorite points when people disagreed or said, because, you know, we live in these myths that people create too. So it's like, those are the moments where we might argue with our siblings. No, I remember it this way. Or I remember. And so I think those were the moments where we were also able to relate the most, even though the truth seems the most sli slippery. It was an awesome approach. You know, the three of us, we all have slightly different backgrounds. And as a public historian, you know, we talk a lot about sharing inquiries, sharing authority, you know, using our platform to shine light on untold or, or purposely suppressed stories. Um, and you just right. really did that without inserting yourself at all. And I think it works. It was wonderful. So let me stop oh. there. This is always my problem. I just want to keep asking questions all day. But we've got to open questions. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. We love talking about it, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> we got to open questions to the audience. So our wonderful audience members there, I hope you've been enjoying this chat with Laura and Emily. Um, pop your questions in the chat and I would be happy to read them for you or by all means, unmute yourself and shout out. We're all friends here, nice and informal. Just go ahead and unmute. Um, while you're looking for your mute buttons, I'll just read this comment from uh, Diane in the chat. Smokey Robinson told the story that Diana Ross was begging him to introduce her group to Barry Gordy, and he didn't want to meet them until they were out of high school. So that's interesting, you know, um, perhaps. Um... Yeah, that, that's actually one of our favorite things to talk about. Oh, uh, go ahead, comment on that. <laughs> because, um, you know, Motown is, has a huge legacy and, and uh, a very storied history and has is you know one of the most successful record labels of all time that has given us some of the best music in the world but it started out very scrappy and um actually motown's first number one hit was the marvelettes please mr postman and the marvelettes were in high school when the song came out they wrote it themselves at least one of the members of the marvelettes uh wrote it wrote the lyrics at least wrote the <laughs> lyrics and came in and ended up collaborating with uh, the motown uh sort of songwriting machine and the song came out and flew up the charts and was a huge hit. And the Marvelettes were immediately urged by Motown to drop out of high school to go out on the on the road. And in a kind of semi-veiled threat, we're told, you know, no one really knows what the Marvelettes look like. Again, what we spoke about before, the cover for Mr. Postman is a mailbox with cobwebs on it. It's not a photo of the Marvelettes. So they had an option to either drop out of high school or and, and uh, let some other girls go out as the Marvelettes or to let some other girls go out as Marvelettes. And they decided to leave school. Actually, Barry Gordy's sister um, ended up adopting one of the Marvelettes who was an orphan and a ward of the state, not so that she could go out on tour with the Marvelettes, but that necessarily, but that is one of the things that happened. And um, there was a lot of strife, you know, their principal pushed back a lot, but they dropped out of school and they went and after that, Motown sort of moved its focus and the Marvelettes were really never paid attention to the way they had been before. When the Supremes came along a few years later, in uh, I think it was 1964 when they first had their first hit, Where Did Our Love Go? They had been hanging around Motown and recording for years, but none of their songs were popular and they had never, they actually called them the no hit Supremes. So Motown has sort of invented this legacy of, you know, we didn't let the Supremes get out there because they were too young and education is so important to us. But the truth is that with the Marvelettes, when it was their, when it was their number one hit with Please Mr. Postman, Motown had them drop out of school to go out on tour and to support Mr. Postman. And so, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily, you know, it just, it's one of those things, you know, like we're talking about in history that people have different perspectives. I bet if you talk to Barry Gordy about it today, he would say, we needed all of our, our acts to finish high school. That was what was important to us. It was certainly what people said that, that we interviewed from Motown, people like Brian Holland, the songwriter, Mickey Stevenson, their A&R guy. But um, the Marvelettes, you know, that that's not the story that they told. 
So I don't know if you want to speak to it any further. Yeah, but. it's a little bit of a bee in my bonnet because I think that, well, first, I don't play favorites with the girl groups, but I do <laughs> very much love that song. So I'll put that out there um, since I was a very young child. So I think to hear the difference in the narrative around the most successful, famous girl group, as opposed to what happened to the first that helped build the company. Um, it's, it felt devastating. You know, these are also the girls are not from Detroit proper. So there was a little bit of, um, they felt multiple people from the group felt and spoke to that they were looked down upon from Detroit, the Detroit people. And perhaps there was an extra edge of like, we can kind of strong arm them a little bit because, um, Barry Gordy's sister's husband was also in the government, was a state legislator or senator, the ones that adopted uh, the ward of the state. So, you know, it it really, the Marvelette story is difficult and, you know, as is the Supremes, but you don't have the six, you don't have a Diana Ross coming out of there to kind of uh, make you feel like there was, a, there was a, a worth, a worth it or something like that. Um, but Katherine Anderson of the Marvelettes did end up grad did go back to school and graduated high school in her 70s. So she she was very proud of that, as she should be. And um, we were really excited to learn that when we spoke to her. Yeah. And oh. she just passed away a few months ago, um, which um, was one of the reasons that we are also so happy that we got to work on this book is that we've lost so many of the women of the girl groups over the last couple of years. Um, and something like, you know, Motown has so much power. There are so many powerful people aff affiliated with Motown. And so they've really had a chance to write their own story the way that they want to write it. And so, you know, in the mission statement of our book and and giving people their own voices to tell their stories their way, that was one of the reasons that we felt that it was so important was that a lot of times when a story has been, you know, kind of canonized or set in stone, that becomes that becomes history. And there are other perspectives. And so we found it very, we were very excited to get that perspective out there of Katherine Anderson's and the other Marvelettes. That was like the perfect question. Was that question planted? <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. And somebody just put, a, put in a question about Florence Ballard from the Supremes and her departure, which is also covered in the book, but is another, um, another thing that, you know, Motown, in terms of their own machine of their publicity and their own legacy has has sort of buried you know their Florence Ballard was the original singer from the Supremes she or the original lead singer and Diana Ross uh, you know has a wonderful voice and style and she ended up being the, the the woman that the hits came out on and when you have a hit you keep on going with the same sound and everything but Diana Ross was very ambitious on the one hand, obviously, yes, she did have a, a personal relationship with Barry Gordy. But on the other hand, and what, what's also covered in our book is that Motown had a, had a finishing school that all of their artists went through where they would take singing and dancing and uh, etiquette lessons. And Diana Ross was notoriously somebody that she was, you know, sometimes groups would, they wouldn't want to go to their classes, they would blow them off. Diana Ross would always be there. If you didn't show up for your slot, she would take your slot. She worked on her, on her craft, on herself, every minute of her of her day that she was not asleep. So you know she was an incredibly hardworking person. It wasn't just that, you know there she people tend to diminish her a little by you know oh she had a relationship with Barry Gordy, she backstabbed Florence Ballard and pushed her out of the group. But the truth was that Florence's story is complicated and you can read about it in the book, but when things are moving so quickly and in interpersonal relationships, especially between young girls that have formed a group, you know, things, people can fall by the wayside and they're, you know, when, when things become stressful and people seem to be turning against you, you know, it's hard. And, and that sort of happened to Florence Ballard and she ended up sort of getting pushed out of the group that she had founded. And, and it was, uh, sort of her demise and it, she is a very her story is probably the saddest story in of the girl groups and in the book but I do think you know we did really try to balance this uh what we see as kind of yeah like now in a position of power you can control the narrative versus 
of course that's going to change things and try to put like a rose colored glasses on things but like we don't want to act as if they're a villain or that it's a malicious intent or you know like we said so many answers and so many candid conversations went with that's the business and that's when we have to come in and I think we see it across not just the music industry but even ourselves in the workplace like how many times have I you know like perhaps not held my tongue with a coworker where I might in an interpersonal relationship at home, right? Like that's the business, that's work, but it's where do we start holding ourselves personally accountable and their desire and to do and accomplish certain things was greater than how they were treating individuals. And people make that decision all the time. Um, and we don't want to villainize them, but we also do want to uphold the women of the girl groups and their truths. I love that. Um, thanks to EM for your nice comment in the chat about how much you're enjoying the program. We're happy to hear that. I see oh, Cindy in the chat. Uh, can't wait to read this and wants the Springsteen Archives to organize a concert with the girl group artists who are still performing. Oh, yeah. oh that'd be a blast. We would, yeah, we would love it. Yeah, there are a panel. bunch of artists that are still. There are a bunch of artists that are still performing. Lala Brooks from the Crystals. Um, I went and saw her two weeks ago. She performed Cousin Brucey, the DJ, put together a show with her. Um, she's fantastic. She's so good. Life. Ageless, fantastic, incredible. Barbara Hawkins from the Dixie Cups, who's, uh, and the Crystals, to do Run Run and Then He Kissed Me are their big songs. Barbara Hawkins from the Dixie Cups, Chapel of Love, uh, just performed at Jazz Fest this year. And the Dixie Cups actually had, were uh, featured on the poster. Uh, Dee Dee Kennebrew from the Crystals is also performing. Darlene Love, of course, is performing not just during the holidays, but all the time. She was just performing with Marilyn McCoo and uh, Billy Davis Jr. from The Fifth Dimension. The Chantels are still out there with most of their original members, which is pretty incredible. Um, the Sh uh, Beverly Lee from the Shirelles. Uh, unfortunately, Shirley Alston Reeves from the Shirelles retired over COVID, as did a, a bunch of artists. But Judy Craig from the Chiffons is still out there performing. So there are a lot of the women of the girl groups performing. And absolutely, Bruce Springsteen should put together a concert. <laughs> Everyone's And I bet a lot would come out of retirement. If absolutely. And <laughs> most people are in the tri-state area. Just saying. <laughs> I, I wrote it down. I'm making notes. We'll have to look at <laughs> Didn't I start this talk by saying we're a very tiny team and no, <laughs> but no, no. It's a great you guys do accomplish so much though. It's really and of course, Diana Ross <laughs> is out there still performing too. Incredible. <laughs> I love it. We'll look into it. Um, Here's another question. What's your take on the role of radio, both black radio and mainstream radio in the success of these girl groups? I, I mean, radio is, you know, we, we went into it a little at, a little bit earlier, but radio is sort of the birth of people being exposed to new music. And so um, when at that time, you know, every household certainly did not have a TV, you know, actually Arlene Smith from the Chantel said that somebody in her building had a TV and it was like going to the movies. Yeah. Kids would go to, to his mom's house to watch TV and it was like the movies because that was the TV in their building. And so the primary source of entertainment was radio. And at the time, AM radio, what was what is what was in the top 40. And it was how people were exposed to news. You know, I, I just um, was at the Atlanta airport and saw Martin Luther King Jr. Some of his things were around, including his transistor radio on display that he always had on to be to be listening to the news all the time to see what was happening 24 seven. And so besides just the independence of being young and having your own transistor radio with your own music, picking up these long wave radio, radio signals from Tennessee and places that are playing completely different music than you would be exposed to necessarily in New Jersey, let's say. It was, you know, people's primary form of entertainment. It was in your car. You know, it was the 1950s and 60s, the beginning of real car culture and the pride people took in in buying a car, having a car, the fun it was to cruise around in your car. And the radio was just what was there all of the time. So I, I think that that's why this music has become the music of the generation that grew up with it. And then every generation since, because it just, people were just completely immersed in it. It was, you know, everywhere all of the time. So 
Um, so yeah, I think that the radio was a huge, if you weren't on the radio, you were nobody back mm -hmm. then, you know, there was not a lot, there, there was not a lot of ways to find, it wasn't like now where you can find some indie group on the internet, you know, you listen to the radio, especially then when AM was the format and, you know, the DJ had, was the most powerful person around who decided what was going to be played and what wasn't. You yeah, did I think DJ that, as they definitely. were following up on their question and saying, let me be a bit more specific, the role of DJs, which so well, that's the, uh, oh, yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, well the DJ was he was the well, yeah, he there weren't really she the most powerful person. I mean, the person who could make or break anyone's career. And obviously, um that was, you know, there was a whole payola issue of people influencing say. DJs to play their artists and there were a lot of um there are a lot of stories about that and then in the late 50s there was the whole payola scandal of of trying to break that break that up even though of course the pay to play thing will always exist in some form but back then DJs really were you know the 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 vehicle for getting something out there and Alan Freed one of the 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 DJ who allegedly coined the term rock and roll uh, out of Cleveland changed people's lives because he was somebody who listened to black music and he would play music by the black artists who originally sang those songs because a lot of those songs were heard and covered by artists like Pat Boone and uh, white artists and so what he would do was he would play the originals and a lot of teenagers didn't even know that there were originals that were sung by black artists and so he opened people's minds and introduced him to all kinds of, of new artists and he paid the price. He went down in the whole payola scandal, but you know, the DJ was probably one of the most powerful people back then. I mean, the DJ also controlled, right? Like it's hard to parse out and put in like an actual, like kind of family tree structure of who controlled what and who had what money. But as we were talking about with publishing rights, um, so part of the payola, which is like essentially just pay to play, it's not always money. A lot of the time in the 50s, it would be the publishing rights. And so, I mean, you'd have to, pro I don't know if you could even find the information, but if you looked at like what songs Dick Clark and Alan Freed owned or names appeared on, I think you'd be floored. And, I, and that went on across the whole country, not just with these powerful uh, national DJs which is another point I was going to get to about the radio is that I think it's pretty wild right for like gener like okay like millennial at its height like to imagine but you know the transistor radio in the 50s we're seeing national distribution for the first time so that's kind of also in line with why we think of this as kind of one of the first pop musics is that we're seeing a nationhood of line up with tech like um technological access you know and I think that not only are you going to get incredible kinds of musics when different genres meet and different types of people meet but I think that we see that reflected in um the the rhetoric of the time on all sides which is that there's a great uh meeting point happening that the girl groups do birth out of but is largely in part due to the power of the radio and in turn the djs had the most power being kind of the cultural gatekeepers um and the ones we remember are alan freed and dick clark because we remember rock and roll because that eventually took over as the main music but at the time those would have been you know nobodies um some annoying teenage music and we would have had totally different djs that we Ad adults would be speaking about so well the hour flew by that is you know the end someone is suggesting we're gonna have to do a part two of this talk or maybe we're available maybe anytime we love, we love talking about girl groups <laughs> maybe i will be able to get that concert together and we'll have to have you come be the mcs i i'll put it on my list oh my gosh, <laughs> But everyone, thank you so much for coming. Please, again, stay up to date with our website. It's springsteenarchives.org or connect on social media. We've got Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify, you name it. Um, our next author talk session is with Warren Zanes on July 8th. We'll be talking about his book, Deliver Me From Nowhere. 
the making of Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska, which is, of course, being turned into a film as we speak. So that'll be another exciting session. You can sign up on our website. Laura, Emily, you have done such tremendous work helping to give these women their voices back. Oh, we had a guest at the last moment. <laughs> helping to give these women their voices back to really help to secure their legacy. And I am so happy that we could help promote it tonight. So thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having us and for so everybody fun. for joining us and listening and asking questions. We awesome. love talking about the girl groups and we didn't even get a chance to talk about how um, Bruce Springsteen helped revitalize the whole genre in the early eighties. So, you know, next to the, till next time. Yeah. <laughs> that, that'll have to be the part. That's it. We're doing it. We're doing the in-person thing. Everybody, okay. Again, we'll, you'll see it on our social media. <laughs> have a great night, everybody. <laughs> thank Bye. you guys. Thank you, thank you everyone. <laughs> Good night.